as the Second World War came to an end, there was a slow shift towards the resumption of more traditional physics activity, as men and women who had been involved in war work on projects such as radar development and nuclear technologies began to return to what had been being done prior to the outbreak of the conflict. While research certainly continued on weapons and reactors, leading both to the development of a fusion-based weapon in 1952 and commercial power plant reactors, which first came online in 1956 in the United Kingdom and 1957 in the United States, there was also a resumption of development of technologies derived from the applications of the principles of quantum mechanics developed in the late 1920s and early 1930s. In 1947, the first transistor was developed by John Bardeen and Walter Bretain at Bell Labs, a discovery for which they would earn the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1956. The first silicon transistors were developed at Bell Labs in 1954 and made commercially available in that same year by Texas Instruments. In 1956, Pauli's neutrino was finally observed by Clyde Cowan and Frederick Raines using first the Hanford production reactors and then later the Savannah River facility in Aiken, South Carolina. John Bardeen, Leon Cooper, and John Robert Schieffer would develop the first working theory of superconductivity in 1957 using those principles developed first by Dirac, Fermi, Einstein, and Bose back in the 1920s. This is something that would net Bardeen his second Nobel Prize in physics, making him the only person to earn two. These discoveries would be part of a huge tectonic shift that included the development of a polio vaccine, urban flight to the suburbs in the United States, the beginning of the construction of the United States interstate highway system, and the rise of commercial airline flight. Even with this progress, however, physics after the war was stuck and had been since the mid-1930s. As you may recall, with the development of various quantum field theories, specifically those dealing with the interaction of electrons and light, known as quantum electrodynamics, or QED, much progress had been made towards understanding just how matter interacted with other matter. Unfortunately, these approaches, as powerful as they were in describing the fundamental processes of nature, had the very significant problem of predicting that the certain value of fundamental quantities that were known to be finite, things such as the charge of the electron, would be infinite. Throughout the mid to late 30s, these infinities resisted the efforts of the world's most brilliant theoretical physicists to resolve them into something that would accurately match what was observed in nature. What it would take to unravel the mystery of these infinities would be the tools and expertise a generation of young students had learned working on the difficult problems of radar and nuclear fission. The minds of Tobinaga, Schwinger, and Feynman would be first trained by the book of Dirac and then sharpened in the fires of World War II to arrive at a solution that would not only resolve the infinities, but that would find a new way to represent the most fundamental processes of nature and call into question the very conception of time. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 22, Renormalization. As I begin this episode of the podcast, I should give a bit of a disclaimer. This is the point where we really start to get into the, quote, queerer than we can imagine, unquote, stuff. I mentioned way back in the first episode of the series. I know that a lot of the things have been pretty strange over the last few weeks, but this week, there's going to be some really odd ideas I'm going to throw out at you. I'll try to keep things relevant and as understandable as I can, but just so you know, we're in the realm of the bizarre now. So let's start with a little review as it's been a while since we've talked about things like quantum field theory. Once quantum mechanics was more or less sorted out by the time of the 1927 Solvay Conference, 
attention turned to working to generalize the quantum approach in two ways. The first was to include the effects of particles moving at speeds close to the speed of light by incorporating Einstein's theory of special relativity into the calculations. This is something we'll just call relativity theory from here on out in this episode. The second was to apply quantum principles to the thing that seemed to mediate the interactions of the various particles, something physicists called a field. From about 1927 through the early 1930s, this work was broadly successful in producing a class of what were known as quantum field theories, the first and best known of which was called quantum electrodynamics or QED which was able to describe how a charged particle, such as an electron, would interact with an electromagnetic field. The most successful part of this was the ability of the theory to generalize Maxwell's equations, those expressions responsible in the 1800s for much of the work of men like Nikola Tesla around the turn of the century, so that they could be applicable to quantum systems. Unfortunately, even as the model was successful in some ways, it introduced new problems into the conversation. The most difficult of these problems to resolve was that of the theory predicting that certain measurable physical quantities would become infinite. Probably the easiest of these to understand had to do with the charge of the electron. Now way back in the early 1900s, Millikan had been able to experimentally measure the charge of an electron. He found that it was a pretty small number but he was able to measure it as a finite value. However, when one attempts to use QED to calculate what the size of that charge should be, one tends to get a result for that quantity that is infinity. So why is this? Well, in order to understand, we have to think a bit about the uncertainty principle and how it relates to this new framework. It turns out that there's not only an uncertainty principle for position and momentum, but one for energy and time as well. This discovery had been made by Niels Bohr as part of an ongoing debate he had with Albert Einstein regarding certain aspects of standard quantum mechanics. What Bohr was able to show was that nature could create energy out of nothing for a very short period of time. Now since Einstein had shown that energy was equivalent to mass, this energy could and would convert into a matter-antimatter pair that would travel a very short distance through space until the two particles collided back together, turning back into energy, which was then sort of winked out of existence. It's kind of like nature can steal from the bank as long as it's for a very, very short period of time. And when I say short, I mean really, really, really short, like femtoseconds short. Now this happens all the time, in supposedly empty space, but when there's an electromagnetic field present, the particles are usually electron-positron pairs, the former having a negative charge and the latter having a positive charge. If this electromagnetic field is produced by a single electron, then the pairs that are created will polarize. This means that the positively charged proton, positrons excuse me, will tend to form towards the electron while the negative electrons in the pair will form away from the electron. As these blink into and out of existence in the space around the electron, they have to be taken into account in the calculation. When this is done, it leads to infinities like we discussed. Now yeah, I know, it's really, really weird, right? So, guys like Heisenberg and Pally and Dirac had a real conundrum on their hands in the 30s, and they spent a lot of time on and off trying to find a solution all the way up to the outbreak of the war. One thing that seemed to work was that they could make adjustments to the mathematics that would eliminate the infinities by doing something we were all taught in school was completely illegal, and that was subtracting infinity from infinity to get an actual finite number. The rationale for this was that when dealing with these infinite quantities, the mathematical theory was sort of ignoring the fact that what was being dealt with were real physical things that had limitations to what could be measured. As such, incorporating these measurement limitations was necessary and could be done with the mathematical sleight of hand I just mentioned. While this approach sort of worked, it was very inelegant and ad hoc, a situation acknowledged by all who worked on it. Now when the war erupted in 1939, 
Almost all effort in theoretical particle physics stopped for reasons we've discussed at some length in previous episodes. The only work that was done to move the field forward was by Heisenberg in 1942 and 43 in his development of S-matrix or scattering matrix theory. I talked a little bit about this in the biographical episodes on Heisenberg. This was his explicit attempt to once again focus only on the observables in determining what was taking place, much as he had done in developing matrix mechanics to recast the Bohr-Sommerfeld model of the atom back in 1925. While his work was initially very promising, it didn't pan out as well as he would have hoped. By focusing on what could be observed, in other words, what came into an interaction between particles and fields, and then what came out of that interaction between the particles and fields, Heisenberg felt that he could put off dealing with the infinite quantities until the rest of the problem was understood. In other words, the S matrix was sort of a quote-unquote black box into which the infinities were pushed until all the other bits could be figured out with the hope that with what they understood, once that was achieved, that would shed light on those things in the box, allowing them to be more accurately determined. While this worked to a degree, it turned out there wasn't enough information coming out of what were called the scattering coefficients to make real headway into resolving the infinities. It wouldn't be until after the war had ended that things would be able to come unstuck, but once they did, just as in 1925 when Heisenberg and Schrodinger both made fundamental contributions to resolving the issues of the old quantum model of the atom, the progress was rapid and groundbreaking. Unlike that other quantum jump in understanding, if you'll pardon the pun, this one didn't require a fundamental reformulation of the understanding of the nature of matter. Just as importantly, the source of this new understanding of how matter and fields interacted happened almost completely outside of the European centers of physics, with much of the work done for the first time in the United States by American physicists. To be sure, each of the contributors could trace their intellectual lineage back to those European centers, either through having done postdoctoral work there, or by studying under or working with someone who did but the new generation of physicists would come out of the work done in scientific projects for the war, using techniques developed to solve the difficult problems those projects encountered. The first clue to a crack in the pre-war quantum theories was something known as the Lamb Shift. In 1947, Willis Lamb and Robert Rutherford were using microwave te techniques developed as part of the radar development project to test a prediction made by Dirac's field theory of electrodynamics. According to Dirac's version of QED, two specific energy levels of the hydrogen atom should have been exactly identical, meaning that the spectral lines they produced in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum should have been the same. What Lamb and Rutherford observed, however, was that the two levels were actually shifted just a tiny amount, about one one millionth of the energy of the energy level itself, from each other, indicating that Dirac's formulation had to be missing something. As strange as it might sound, this experimental result, showing a deficiency in the present theory, was enough to set a number of physicists to work trying to revise Dirac's ideas to take this shift into account. This is a great example, by the way, of progress in science. If Dirac's version of QED had been completely correct, it would have left physicists no path forward to resolve the issues of infinities. By finding a place where its predictions failed to accurately describe what took place in a physical system, even if that discrepancy was super, super tiny, that pointed others in a direction to modify what was going on in order to explain that tiny discrepancy. As I've been telling my students for the last week or so, doesn't matter if a hypothesis or theory is completely accurate. What matters is that it can be tested by making falsifiable predictions. If it does this, even if those predictions are wrong, the theory can then be modified to account for the new observations and progress can be made. Now why did this shift in energy level happens? 
it goes back to that idea of virtual pair production allowed by the energy time version of the uncertainty principle. In earlier versions of QED, the calculations of both this vacuum polarization, as it was called, and the size of the charge were infinite, something that was obviously at odds with what was observed. What the Lamb shift seemed to show was that these two infinities were not quite equivalent in some sense. The first person to attempt to take this non-equivalence into account was Hans Bethe, who did a crude version of the calculation of that difference on a train ride back to Schenectady, New York from New York City, where he had given a presentation at the Shelter Island Conference. This conference was an important event, as it was the first major conference in the United States following the war, and the first time a large group of researchers could gather and talk shop without someone looking over their shoulders and asking of the discussion, has this been cleared by security, as Julian Schwinger would later say. Here we see the absolute importance of scientific communication in the process of inquiry. It was at this conference that Lamb first presented his detailed results of the energy shift. It was also here that I. I. Rabi would announce the first precise measurement of what is now known as the magnetic moment of the electron, another important quantity for what, understanding what's going on in various field theories. As a short digression here, and not the only one we'll take, right? The award should be said about Hans Bethe. Born in Germany in 1906, Bethe would earn his PhD under Sommerfeld in Munich, like so many others. He would then do his postdoctoral work first at Cambridge with Ralph Fowler's group alongside Dirac, and then in Rome with Enrico Fermi in 1931. Due to his Jewish heritage, Bethe lost his academic post in Germany in 1933 and after fleeing to Manchester, he immigrated to the United States in 1935 to take a post at Cornell. During this time, Beta became interested in work in both nuclear physics and stellar astrophysics, fields he would contribute to in very, very fundamental ways. As the war began in Europe, Beta contributed a number of pieces of munitions research to allied agencies, even as he was still classified as an enemy alien. In 1941, he received a security clearance and began to work at the MIT Radar Lab doing work in microwave radiation. In 1942, he would transfer to the Manhattan Project and would be named as the director of the T, or Theoretical Division. As part of this work, Veda would calculate the critical mass of U-235 needed, as well as oversee the work of designing the implosion charges for the plutonium bomb design. Among his research team was a brilliantly talented young physicist by the name of Richard Feynman. After the war, Beta would put his work in microwave research from the radar lab to good use in calculating this first solution to the Lamb effect. It is this work that we discuss here. Before we return to that topic, it should be noted that Beta remained active in cutting-edge research in physics throughout his life, publishing at least one noteworthy paper every decade of his life up until his death at age 98 in 2005. Freeman Dyson, who was a student of Beta's, called him, quote, the supreme problem solver of the 20th century, unquote. Coming from Dyson, that's high praise indeed. Okay, so back to our narrative. What Beta was able to do was show that the various infinities could be absorbed into the constants that they re were to represent. As an example, the infinity associated with the charge of the electron and the infinity associated with the vacuum polarization charge could be combined to give the actual measured charge of the electron. In essence, what Beta's method was saying is that you actually never saw the charge of the real electron, whatever that meant, itself when you took a measurement. What you always saw when you made a measurement was the combination of that charge of the electron and the sea of virtual particles around it that were always there in the vacuum of space. As an aside, I just gotta wonder what Aristotle or the corpuscular atomists of the Enlightenment like Boscovich would have said of all of this. So, by doing this, a procedure that would become known as renormalization, the infinities were removed from the theory and while Beta's calculations ignored the relativistic corrections, they still came surprisingly close to accounting for the measured Lamb shift. 
So what renormalization says is that rather than taking some abstract idea of a bare charge as being the important fundamental quantity to work with, we should be thinking that it is the actual thing that we measure that's the real quantity of effective charge. And so all those theoretically infinite things that make up the measurable quantity should be absorbed into it and thus done away with. This insight gave the physics community a possible way forward out of the morass of infinities that had plagued QED. The difficulty was that Beta had only shown that this was possible and had only done this for non-relativistic systems, which was kind of a step back from Dirac's version of QED. And speaking of Dirac, he never came over to this approach to resolving the issues with QED. For him, there was a deep repugnance to all of this quote-unquote sleight of hand as he considered it, as it was mathematically inelegant. However, the proponents of the strategy made the philosophical point that it was inappropriate to be talking about unobservable quantities like the naked charge of the electron. They argued, from a positivist perspective, that science can only proceed from observable and measurable quantities, and thus it is both philosophically and practically more correct to fold the unobservable terms into the observable thing. Unfortunately, Dirac was never satisfied with this and would die believing that his life's work had been a waste, as he still couldn't describe how an electron and a photon interacted, even as others had moved far beyond the problem. What this meant, however, was that if you were going to make this work, you had to show that the infinities would always come in these sorts of pairs that can be combined to give finite and measurable physical quantities. And you've got to do it with the full integration of the principles of quantum mechanics and special relativity, something that would require an enormous attention to detail and some real calculational aptitude. Fortunately, the wartime projects had produced a generation of physicists who were equipped to do just that. The first two physicists to do this work were Sin Itero Tomanaga and Julian Schwinger in 1948 and 1949. Tomonaga, working in Japan, and Schwinger at Harvard, independently did the painstaking work of deriving all of the terms in detail and showing that using the already existing framework of quantum field theory, along with the procedure of renormalization, they could account for all of the problems of QED. Both men would draw on previous work they had done during their involvement in their country's respective radar projects during World War II that required that they use the sort of black box techniques to push things they couldn't measure into things they could, as well as long practice with being extremely careful to see to the mathematics of the theory in order to make sure that they accounted for all of the infinities consistently, so that they were always paired up, something that only happened once all of the relativistic contributions were taken into account. The other representation of this grew out of an extremely different perspective on the problems of QED from an ambitious, free-thinking physicist from New York, Richard Feynman. As a graduate student of John Archibald Wheeler's, Feynman had done a great deal of work reformulating and extending Dirac's path integral approach to quantum mechanics. Upon graduation, Feynman, as mentioned before, went to work in Beta's T division of the Manhattan Project, impressing everyone who saw his contributions. After the end of the war, he followed Beta to Cornell, where he would return to his work on QED, first continuing with the path integrals, but soon developing a very powerful pictorial way of representing the interactions between particles known eventually as Feynman diagrams. These diagrams originally grew out of Feynman's need to keep track of all of the complex terms in his path integral calculations, but as he developed them, he found that they, in fact, provided a wonderful shorthand way to represent interactions between different types of particles and fields. Now it's here that we run into one of the fundamental limitations of an audio podcast. I can't actually draw you a Feynman diagram. 
While I will put a few of them on the podcast webpage if you'd like to take a look, I expect most of you are engaged in activities that preclude you from going out there while listening. So I'll try to give you a description that still moves the episode forward without being too confusing, if that's possible. What a Feynman diagram does is it uses a picture to represent the math of quantum electrodynamics in a shorthand way. Fermions, things like electrons, are represented on the diagram as straight arrows. Bosons, things like photons, are represented with wavy lines on the diagram. When the two things interact, their lines intersect on the diagram to create a vertex. The final important thing about this is that the pictures are always drawn from left to right because that's the way time moves forward in the picture. So if you can imagine this with your mind's eye on a piece of paper, think of that as a frame. An electron line with an arrow comes into the frame from the top left of it. It travels for a bit and then it emits a photon that is drawn as a wavy line starting from the electron line and then moving towards the lower right hand corner of the frame. At the place where that happens, the electron line sort of kinks up to the top right of the frame. The point where the photon is emitted from the electron, causing the electron line to kink, is called that vertex. Now each of these relatively simple pieces represents a bunch of mathematics related to calculating quantities in the interaction, such as the probability that the electron will emit a photon and with what energy. In other words, each piece of this diagram can be thought of as sort of a letter in an alphabetic code that can be made, used to make up words and then sentences, at least in terms of the mathematics. In other words, these words and sentences therefore represent much more complex mathematical equations that express the physical processes in great detail. The letters and words, however, are much easier to work with and thus allow the physicist who uses them to get a much better sense of what's possible. It should be noted that Feynman initially didn't bother to develop formal mathematical rules for the use of the various diagram elements, relying instead on his own intuition developed from years of working in field theory and complex calculational models during the war. It would fall to later physicists and mathematicians to provide that deductive framework that would express when certain relationships were valid. One of the first insights Feynman gained from using the diagram was an understanding that as far as the math was concerned, an electron moving forward in time was identical to a positron moving backwards in time. Thus, the diagram I described above could also represent an electron coming in from the top left of the picture and colliding with a positron coming in from the top right of the picture. The collision of the matter-antimatter pair would cause an annihilation of both particles, fully converting their mass and energy into a gamma ray photon that traveled off towards the bottom right of the picture. The insight that antimatter particles could be thought of as regular matter particles moving backwards in time was a revelation. The diagrams captured the mathematics correctly regardless of which direction one moved in time. Another important consequence of the diagrams was that they allowed the physicists to calculate the probability of any process or combination of processes that took a system from one input state to a different output state. What Feynman recognized was that for any sort of quantum mechanical process, there were a multitude of different ways in which the process could actually occur. There would be an obvious way for the process to happen but there would be other less obvious and hopefully less probable ways for that thing to happen as well. Let me give you sort of an example of this kind of thing in the real world. Now let's say I'd like to drive from Macon, Georgia to Atlanta, Georgia. The most obvious way for me to do this and hopefully to arrive would be to jump on I-75 north and drive the roughly 80 miles and hope I don't hit any bad traffic that keeps me from getting there. Which means I'm going to have a certain probability on I-75 of getting from Macon to Atlanta. However, there are other paths from Macon to Atlanta. I might decide to get on one of the well-developed secondary roads like US Highway 41. 
or I couldn't de decide to take some combination of state highways, such as Georgia 23 and Georgia 87. I could even, possibly, jump on residential streets from town to town, throwing in a few dirt roads here or there. And depending on how far out of my way I'm willing to travel, there may be literally thousands of possible routes or paths for me to get from Macon to Atlanta. Now if this process were one governed by the rules of quantum field theory, each of those paths would have a certain probability that I would take it and a certain probability that I would get to Atlanta. If you wanted to know the total probability that I would make it to Atlanta, you'd have to add up all of those probabilities of all of those paths. The formal name for this is called the path integral formulation. As I mentioned before, it actually dates all the way back to Dirac. And it's a way of adding up all of the actually infinite possible ways for a process to happen. Now normally, if one thought that there was an infinite number of paths, and at each path had a no matter how small, still finite probability of happening, then it would seem that you'd have a problem of creating another type of infinity, the thing that this process was developed to avoid. But let's think about our trip to Atlanta. Let's say, you know, for argument's sake, that for each turn off of a bigger road in onto a smaller road, there was only one-tenth of the chance that I'd take the path and make it to Atlanta, all other things being equal, that is. What that would mean is that I'd only have one-tenth the probability of getting to Atlanta if I took the U.S. highway, and one one-hundredth of the probability that I'd make it to Atlanta if I took the state highway if I had to turn onto it from the US highway. And that would be only if I had to make one turn. As it turns out, when you add all of these things up, that multiplier out in front, what's sort of called a probability coefficient, is very important because it has to do with a mathematical idea called convergence. If you sum up an infinite series of numbers, the sum can diverge in some cases, but converge to a finite answer in others. For example, if you sum up all the positive integers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, etc., 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 that number is going to be infinite. That series diverges. But if you sum up all the powers of 1 half, i.e., 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth, etc., etc., it turns out that number is not infinite. That series is said to converge. It turns out that if the probability of something happening is less than one half, then that infinite series converges to a finite number. What Feynman was able to show is that for QED, that probability factor is something known as the fine structure constant, which is 1 over 137. And so, his summation of all of those probabilities was going to turn out to be a finite probability of things happening. So, in 1948, much as was the case in 1926, we have two seemingly very different ways of formulating this new approach to field theories in general and quantum electrodynamics in particular. As was the case in matrix and wave mechanics in 26, both seemed to work very well in solving the various problems of the old version of theory, but it wasn't clear that they were all the same thing. It would fall to Freeman Dyson to show, as Pauli and Dirac had once done, in terms of quantum mechanics, that the two formulations were, in fact, equivalent. And he did so by using that old tool of Heisenberg's that hadn't seemed like it moved things forward much, the S matrix. Since the S matrix was founded on the idea of focusing on the observables of the system, it proved to be the bridge that was needed between the two approaches. With that bridge in place, the idea of renormalization was quickly, if somewhat uneasily, accepted into the pantheon of physical theories. Tomonaga, Schwinger, and Feynman would share a joint Nobel Prize in 1965, though Dyson would be left out of the recognition, an oversight many feel is tremendously unjustified. Thus, renormalization became, for a time, the de facto standard for all work involving the nature of matter. So powerful an approach was it that all other field theory applications were evaluated in terms of its requirements, and those found to be in violation of the condition, 
that all infinities get absorbed into the various measurable physical constants were declared either incorrect or incomplete. These included both the nuclear force of Yukawa as well as Fermi's neutron decay interaction. While it was clear that both of these ideas pointed towards additional interactions on the nuclear scale, they both lacked the criterion of convergence when path integrals were calculated. It would fall to future physicists to work out just how quantum field theories could be constructed that would account for these effects. As a final piece of the story, I'd like to take just one further digression. While what I've given you in this episode is the mostly standard and well-established narrative, founded on a well-documented paper trail, there is something of a coda to be mentioned. It turns out that prior to Beta, Tobinaga, Schwinger, and Feynman, there was another physicist who seems to have glimpsed all of this long before anyone else had. Ernst Stuckelberg was a talented Swiss student who was invited to attend Sommerfeld's seminar series in Munich after graduating from the University of Basel in 1923. He earned his PhD in Munich in 1927 after doing work in cathode ray research and was appointed an assistant professor at Princeton. In 1932, as the American economy completely tanked, he returned to Zurich after Pauli had made the theoretical physics program there world class. And finally, in 1934, he took a full professorship appointment at the University of Geneva. Due to his interaction with Pauli and Gregor Winsel at Zurich, Stuckelberg turned his research to elementary particles, and in 1934, he published the first full version of quantum mechanics that took into account smaller order corrections to various terms. In 1935, prior to Yukawa's work on the subject, he suggested a nuclear force based on boson exchange, but didn't publish it because Pauli told him it was absolutely ridiculous. In 1938, he did work on what is strikingly similar to what Higgs did to propose the Higgs boson. And in 1941, he was the first to suggest that the positron was an electron moving backwards in time. In 1943, he developed a version of renormalization that predated those of Tobinaga, Schwinger, and Feynman. So why don't we know this guy? And why didn't he receive multiple Nobel Prizes for his contributions? The answer to this lies in two areas. First, Stuckelberg had the habit of working in his own really bizarre notation. This way of communicating was nearly unrecognizable to other physicists, and most notably, journal editors, who had difficulty making heads or tails of what it was really trying to say. Related to this, Stuckelberg tended to publish his most important work in relatively unknown and unread journals, and thus his contributions were often overlooked by the broader particle physics community. Author Jagdish Mira tells the story of an occasion of Feynman lecturing at CERN not long after receiving his Nobel Prize. Stuckelberg was in the audience. Mira says, quote, After the lecture, Stuckelberg was making his way out alone from the CERN amphitheater when Feynman, surrounded by his admirers, made the remark, He, meaning Stuckelberg, did the work and walks alone towards the sunset, and here I, Feynman, am covered in all the glory, which rightfully should be his. At just the time when his contributions were becoming better known, however, Ernst worked with the mathematician Andre Peterman to discover and develop the foundational rules upon which renormalization was formally constructed. Published in 1953, this was research of enormous consequence. It would, in time, lead to the Nobel Prize winning work of Kenneth G. Wilson in developing the standard model of particle physics. In 1976, Stuckelberg was awarded the prestigious Planck Medal for extraordinary achievement in theoretical physics. In our next episode, I'd like to wrap up our consideration of the nature of matter and what has become of the atom. Between now and then, if you're enjoying the show, why not leave us a review on whatever service you use to listen? If you don't have one, iTunes would be great. It really does help us get the word out, and it lets me know how I'm doing. In an update on our effort to come up with a name for the crew, faithful listener Andrew Mentz has suggested the moniker Lab Rats.
If you've got some thoughts on that, drop us a line on our Facebook page or at thescientificodyssey.typepad.com. Until next time, full sails on your journey.